Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here tonight. My name is Ash. I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective and I'm very much looking forward to hearing tonight's readings and discussion between two of our favorite writers, Margaret Kiljoy and Cadwell Turnbull. Um, Margaret's new collection of short fiction, We Won't Be Here Tomorrow, is just out from AK Press. And Cadwell's most recent novel, No Gods, No Monsters, has just been released in paperback. Before we start, um, if this is your first time joining an event with us, Firestorm Books is a 14-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina. We're an anarchist collective that specializes in titles related to feminism, queerness, social movements, and radical politics. Firestorm is also a community event space. Um, however, due to the ongoing pandemic, we continue to hold our community and author events entirely online. With that said, uh, we do have a list of exciting virtual events coming up. Next, mo next month, we'll feature titles that spotlight queer memoir, uh, facing the climate crisis, building a participatory economy, and original horror from writers of color. So if you're interested in signing up for those or any other events happening through Firestorm, you can follow us on social media, and I'll also drop a link to our community calendar in the chat. A note for those of you attending in the live audience, uh, tonight's speakers are excited to field your questions. So if you're interested in asking anything at any point, uh, I'll encourage you to, to just submit your questions throughout the discussion by using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen if you're attending on Zoom or in the comments if you're following along on the Facebook live stream. Cool. Moving on to tonight's speakers. Uh, Margaret Kildray is a trans feminine author, musician, and podcaster living in the Appalachian Mountains. She is the author of A Country of Ghosts, as well as the Danielle, Danielle Kane novella series, and is the host of two popular podcasts, Live Like the World is Dying, and Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff. Mm -hmm. Cadwell Turnbull's short fiction has appeared in The Verge, Lightspeed, Nightmare, Asmanov's science fiction, and several other anthologies. His novel, The Lesson, was the winner of the 2020 Newcomb Institute Literary Award in, in the debut category. Cadwell lives in Raleigh and teaches at North Carolina State University. Uh, so Margaret, Cadwell, thanks so much for taking the time to be here tonight and share your work with us. And I believe I'm going to pass it over to Cadwell to start. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be doing this with Margaret. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from early in the book. It's going to be two chapters. Hopefully, it's under 15 minutes. Um, it's from the perspective of Lena. She's one of the main characters. She's just, um, um, her brother has just um, lost his life um, um, due to an officer-involved shooting. And she's, she desperately wants to know what happened. She also feels responsible for the trajectory of his life. And um, she receives this jump drive through um, strange means. And I'm gonna read from this section where she views its contents. Chapter 10. Lena waits until Ridley is asleep before slinking into the living room with her laptop. She sits on the couch, types in her password, and stares at her desktop for a long time. Behind the clutter of documents and folders lies a Japanese-style painting of a carp, the scales intricately drawn like the tips of overlapping fingernails freshly polished in gold. Around the carp, splashes of watercolors bleed together, the edges of the painting fading to white. The tiny monolith is so light in her palm, it should have more weight, be more substantial. She has tried all day to put the jump drive into the USB port and view its contents, 
but each time all the doubts and fears rise up to block her path. This video may show her brother running through the streets in the midst of some episode, or worse, rushing toward a policeman with violence in his eyes. No, there has to be more. Why didn't they release it? Why were they so nervous? Her palms is itching, her mouth is dry, and her heart is thro throbbing until she knows she won't be able to go back to sleep. She has to know. She removes the thin cap from the jump drive and sees it in the port. The computer recognizes it immediately. No alarms, no signs of some virus ripping the guts out of her PC. The hardest step is done, just a little further. She clicks on a notification that appears in the upper right corner of the taskbar. A small window opens and she selects open files. Like the drive itself, the contents are unassuming. The drive has only one untitled folder and in it only one file titled video 001. Nina clicks on the file and puts on her headphones. At first, she doesn't know what she's looking at. Everything is black. In her headphones, she hears labored breathing and then a man whispering that he's still in pursuit. On the screen, she sees movement and then realizes that the man, the cop, has, has been standing behind a parked car and is now on the sidewalk. Something flashes across the screen, a hand most likely, and moments later, a gun is in view pointed ahead. Nina's breath catches in her throat and she leans forward, her hand to her mouth. This could be it, the moment her brother dies. The body cam shakes as the cop begins running. I see it, he says, and there's panic in the words. It's big. Nina inhales sharply and has but a moment to consider what it is before she sees it too, a few feet down the sidewalk. It turns as the cop approaches, bares his teeth and growls. The body cam shakes so hard the image blurs, but she can still see the eyes of the thing reflecting light, the bright orbs turning to streaks as it surges forward. Three shots pop in Lena's ears, the thing howling as at least one of them hits its mark. The cop is backstepping fast, but keeping his gun pointed at the thing pursuing him, dog-like, Lena is thinking, although it is much bigger than any dog she's seen. When the hulking animal leaps into the air, the cop follows it with his gun, screaming and releasing four more shots all at once. A fraction of a second later, the animal collides with the cop from above, everything shaking now. The sky comes into view, starlight streaking by like thin comets before a mountain of hair obscures the body cam. There's a cop's panicked breaths and more screaming before Lena catches sight of one of the cop's legs. Something scrapes against the pavement like metal. She has to focus to make sense of what she is seeing, the cop dragging himself backward, the shuddering body of the huge beast revealing itself. The animal moans and whimpers, crawls forward. The fur around one eye is matted with dark blood. Then you can see the muzzle, the blood-stained teeth, and the long pointed ears. And then after a few more attempts to move, it collapses, the great furry head flopping to the pavement. With a final shudder, it stops moving. The cop gets to his feet and radios that shots have been fired. He looks around a bit, the body cam shifting back and forth, taking in some of the world around. Next to the sidewalk, a line of parked cars stretch down the street in one direction, across the sidewalk, a block of residential homes. A woman comes out of her door and stands on the porch. She has her phone in her hand and it is pointed down out of view where the animal lies. The light from the phone is very bright. Go back inside, says the cop. I'll dispose of it, don't worry. Why would you say that? The woman asks. A moment passes. Nina can't really see the woman's face, but she recognizes the disbelief in her voice and the horror. The cop must have too, because he doesn't answer the question, but takes a few steps back. He's off the sidewalk now, standing between two cars. From that vantage, Lena can see the spot where the animal was slain. Only the animal is gone and a naked man is in his place. I don't understand, the cop says. Lena doesn't either. The voice comes out of the dark beyond her computer screen to make the leap that Lena's mind can't. Your brother, the voice says, coming through the noise in her headphones as if by strange magic. No, Lena says, what? I don't understand, the cop shouts again in her ears. That is your brother lying there, the voice says. I, Lena feels dizzy. The cop is screaming. I don't understand what is happening. Oh God, no. Lena pulls off the headphones and flings them. She slams the laptop shut. I can't, she says. I hope I haven't broken you, the voice says. This is what you wanted, what they kept from you. 
now that you have it, what will you do? Lena feels as if she is rushing towards something at great speed, outpacing the reality she knows. She enters an open space so vast she can't feel the edges. She's been blasted open and feels herself as wide as the universe. The question the voice asks seems far away, and Lena has to pull herself back to it, to focus on each word so that she can make some sense of this place that no longer makes sense. She combines the words and uses them as a place to plant, plant her feet. Her lips form words, the muscles in her face and the nerves in her throat bringing back her blasted bits into solid form. I will make amends. Good, the voice says. It is here that I stop time. The world around us slows, all matter falls still, and all around stops, all sound stops. There's only the voice and me. I reach out to the formless thing, trying to access his mind, but finding nothing. In all my time traveling the fact of sea, this has never happened. Minds are always open to me. What are you, I ask directly. What is this? For a terrible moment, the voice doesn't answer. And for the first time, I feel a sense of danger I've never thought to feel. I've signed a contract, it finally says. I'm bound not to speak to you. By whom? The universe, it says. And the voice answers no more of my questions. 11. What is this about, really asks, as Lena sits him down in the living room. The television is already on, the sound low. Ridley takes one look at the screen and stops asking. The video has been playing periodically for at least an hour and will likely play on every channel for many days to come. Ridley turns to watch her, his mouth a wordless question, and stares at the screen again. The sun is beginning to rise and a little bit of early morning light cuts through the window behind the television. She has footsteps in the apartment above and people walking down the halls, knocking on doors. Her cell phone buzzes on the coffee table. She imagines a whole world like this. Footsteps, knocks on doors, buzzing phones, minds being blown apart. Ridley watches, his hand to his mouth. I don't understand, the cop says again, as he'd said every time she watches the video and the several times she watched it when she posted it to streaming sites. She was being thorough in case some black hand might act quickly to take the video down. Within 20 minutes, the clip is on all social media sites. Within 25 minutes, it's trending everywhere. The body cam reveals her naked body and her naked brother lying face down on the pavement, dead beyond recall, gone forever. Willie stutters out words only he can understand. He's heading down his own tunnel now, entering his own cavern at the end of it, feeling himself expand, and Lena will not interrupt. Upstairs, someone makes a noise, muffled through layers of walls, and something crashes loudly. In the hall, footsteps quicken. Outside, a car screeches to a halt. The neighborhood is an egg cracking open. What will come next? They will try to deny this video, discredit it. She can't control that. She has done her part. Who leaked it? Ridley asks her. He's shaking, struggling to keep himself together. She doesn't need to say it. Already he is watching her face, reading the truth clearly written there. Babe, they'll come for you. Who will? She asks. Sweating, Ridley really glances around the room as if people were hiding in the walls. This is the only answer he's capable of offering. Don't worry, Lena wants to say. I didn't use my personal accounts. No one knows who I am. But even as she thinks the words, she knows that she could be terribly wrong. She has kicked something whose contour she can't begin to imagine. Perhaps she has miscalculated completely. Perhaps this is all a game happening above her head, and she is a sacrifice. Pack some bags, she says. As Ridley rushes down the, um, as Ridley as Ridley rushes to the bedroom, she listens to people yelling outside. No, now the noises are too much. She can't track it all. She has Ridley pull a large suitcase down from the closet. Should they even be wasting time with suitcases and clothes? She pictures men in dark clothes approaching the apartment building. It might be too late already. Just keep watching the television, says the voice, this time right in her ear. Breaking news flashes on the television. And then another video comes on. This one, an aerial shot. A helicopter? No, too close to the ground. Maybe a drone? The video is very clear, crisp in a way hers is not. Something like relief fills her when she sees, with absolute clarity, a pack of large animals forming a line all the way across what Lena knows to be 
MA28 North, connecting to Interstate 93 South. Is it strange to feel relief at something that terrified her only hours before? That even with the shock of everything, Lena understands that this can only be good for her. It means she is not alone, that it will be much harder for anyone to discredit her brother's death. The line of animals, wolf-like now that she can see clearly, stand a few feet apart. She counts seven in all, blocking traffic in both directions. Lincoln was not alone either. He had family. Really rolls out a large suitcase and stands next to Lena, saying nothing. All the noise of outside now inconsequential compared to the image before their eyes. The wolf howls and the rest join in, the sound sustained and ghostly like wind through hollow bones. They all begin to rise on their hind legs, and even from this distance, it is clear to Lena just how massive they are. As they stand, their bodies begin to shrink, their fur pulling in, heads compressing down into something more compact. Within a matter of moments, they've transformed, and now a line of seven naked men and women of different hues and body types stand across the highway. Ridley makes a quiet, muffled sound, part groan, part sharp in inhalation. But Lena keeps silent, her breath and body held tight. The video cuts out in response to the sudden appearance of the naked men and women. That even though Lena has met Rebecca only once, she recognizes her immediately standing at the corner, standing at the center of the line in a position of power, fierce eyes aimed straight at the camera. Lena surprises herself by smiling. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm next. Uh, well, of two, but makes me next. I'm really excited uh, to have Cadwell. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this book tour thing. This is the virtual event on the book tour. And I'm at event like, this is event like five or something. And I'm a little bit losing my brain. So I apologize for that. It's been a long time since I've interacted with humans, let alone a lot of them all at once. Uh, but I was really excited to have Cadwell on this. When I when I first started reading No Gods, No Monsters, which everyone should go out and get, um, I was like reading it and I was like, okay, I don't know what this book is about. I, I usually try not to know what a book is about before I read it. And so I start reading it and I know it has a, a sick title and you know, it's referenced to the anarchist slogan, No Gods, No Masters. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. And I'm like, oh, and the writing's really good. And then I get to like, oh, and there's fucking werewolves. Oh, I'm I'm really fucking excited about this. Um, and so, I don't know, thanks Cadwell for, for coming and reading one yeah. of my favorite chapters of that. Um, I'm gonna read uh, a story. So yeah, I'm on tour with my, my book, We Won't Be Here Tomorrow. Um, and I'm gonna read a, one of the, I'm gonna read the last story in it, which is a short story. Also hopefully it'll be around 15 minutes. Um, you'd think I would have timed this more carefully. And, this one is a story that uh, means a lot to me because uh, essentially my dad wrote it first. It's um, It was presented to me when I was a kid as just a, a folk story that you know my dad presented. Eventually I realized that my dad made it up. And so I, I felt like in good dutiful daughter form, I would write a version of it myself and, and change it up of course. Um, and you know, I'm, the, this whole book, this anthology of short stories is dedicated to my, my father who really did a lot of work to um, set me on the task of writing um, by always being, well, not necessarily being encouraging in my writing, but just by always sort of doodling at stories himself, telling really beautiful stories, and then um, having books, science, weird science fiction books all over the house when I was a kid. Uh, so I, I, I don't think he's in the audience. I don't know. I didn't actually look at the audience list. But um, so this is a story that I stole from my dad. It's called The 37 Marble Steps. I grew up near the foothills of Appalachia and there's something to these forests. The trees themselves aren't old, but the mountains are old. The mountains are old and battered and smoothed over, over and what is a forest but the outbursting of life come up from the land. The trees themselves are not old, but the forests are old because these mountains are old. I grew up near the foothills of Appalachia and I remember when the Blair Witch Project came out, set close to where I lived, it didn't surprise anyone. Like, yeah, the movie is a work of fiction, but there's still something to these mountains and these forests. There's still something there, something that that movie drew from. My father told me this story when I was a kid. 
He told me this story under the boughs and the stars, and it's not something I'll ever forget. The next day, he took me to the place it happened. He took me to the marble steps. There are 37 marble steps in the middle of the forest, far from any road. The steps climb steep and twisted up from a seasonal creek up to a tiny concrete foundation peppered with stones. There's no house up there anymore. There is, however, a crack in the foundation. The crack is narrow and long and underneath there's nothing, not soil, not rock, just nothing. You shine your flashlight through that crack and you see nothing. You slide your skinny arm through that crack and you feel nothing. You drop a coin through that crack and you hear nothing. I tried all of those things. There was a house on that foundation years ago, years before my father was born, probably before his mother was born, maybe before her mother came over from the old country fleeing persecution. I couldn't tell you when exactly there was a house on that foundation. It doesn't make sense for there to have ever been, been one, not out where there's no road, not out where whoever built it had to carry marble and concrete on their back or the backs of animals. I can't tell you why there was a house. I can only tell you that there was one. I can tell you about the woman who lived there too. I can tell you that she didn't have a name, that she didn't need name. Names are not for yourself, they're for other people. You live alone in a house in the woods at the top of the marble steps and you don't need a name because no one calls you anything. The people from the nearby town, they just called her the woman who lived in the woods. This woman lived alone and she was ageless like all women who live alone. She lived only five miles or so from the nearby town. That town is gone now too. It probably had a name, though I don't know it. The woman lived close enough that people hiking or hunting in the forest saw smoke from her chimney, and some saw the light in her windows. Sometimes people even saw her herself wandering the forest. They saw her hair pinned up in a bun in the summer and under hats and hoods in the winter. They saw her gaze, alternatively blank and fierce. Sometimes they heard her sing. It went like this. She walked paths through the woods, sometimes down even to the road alongside the town. She had a stick in one hand, a burlap sack in the other. Bad man, bad man, braze the bones, she sang as she beat bushes with a stick. A good whack, a good thump against the bushes. Bugbear, bugbear, boil the bra. Animals, all kinds of animals, would run out from the bushes and the brambles right into her sack. Rabbits, groundhogs, snakes possums, raccoons, mice, birds, and lizards. Every creature under the sun and every creature that hides from the sun would run right towards her and into that sack. Once it was good and full, she'd twist the end closed, lift it like it weighed nothing, and beat the bag with the stick until the squirming stopped and the crying stopped and everything inside was either dead or willing to pretend. She'd throw that bag over her shoulder and walk away, whistling now instead of singing. That same tune, I know the tune, I could hum it to you, but I don't know how to write it. So maybe that tune will die out one day and maybe we'll all be safer when it does. Dogs went missing sometimes around that town. Cats too, lambs and calves and chickens. Never children. One reason people in the town put up with that woman as long as they did is that whenever a kid went missing, they'd wind up back at home right in their crib, not crying, the blood of berries tinting their lips. One day, a little girl, not yet seven years old, got swept away by the river. Surely she drowned, the parents thought, the whole town thought. That night, she walked up to her own house wearing a burlap dress, her hair brushed and braided, her belly full. She didn't say a word about what happened, but everyone knew that the lady with the bag and the stick was watching out. It went like that for years, for generations. Was it the same woman? No one could tell. Bruno, Bruno, bake the bread, she sang. Boatman, boatman, baste the bear. A good whack, a good thump, and she had the animals. And off she went on her way. Never said a soul to, never said a word to a soul. This was fine, and this was good, and no one in town thought too hard on it. Until one day, it wasn't fine. It wasn't good. People mostly want to let each other alone, and that woman wasn't hurting anyone. A boy came up in that town, and he became a man while he was at school in a nearby city, and when he came back as a man, he decided he wasn't going to be the sort to just let people alone. John was his name, at least as I have it. Big John, they called him, because there was an awful lot of Johns, and this John was the tallest. One day in early March, John was walking home from the mill. 
The sun was near to set and the wind was something wild and a little bit of snow was being thrown here and there. He saw the woman and he heard the woman and he saw a cat run into her bag and he decided enough was enough. He waited until she was far enough distant and then followed her up through the woods, up to that seasonal creek. Most people, they took one leak, look at that house up on the top of those marble steps perched down over the gully, and they went right back the way they came. Big John, though, he waited until the woman went into the house, then he climbed each of those steps up himself, up each of those steps himself. Smoke was pouring out the chimney and the lamplight flickered through the unshuttered windows, and Big John went up to one of those windows and looked inside. The woman was there, and she had the sack over one shoulder and she went to the middle of the bare concrete floor and she tapped her stick seven times. Tap, 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 tap. She tapped her stick seven times and she stepped back and she waited and a trap door was there where nothing had been. And she reached down and grabbed the iron rung and pulled it up and Big John heard a wailing, a keening from within. He couldn't describe it better than that. In all the years he tried, inhuman, in animal, demonic, the woman upended the sack. Animals, including the cat, tumbled out into the darkness. Soon after, far worse sounds came from that trap door. And the woman smiled and cooed like she was tending a pet, and she closed that trap door. She tapped on it seven times with her stick. Tap, 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 tap. The trap door was gone. On the wall, hung up with the coats and the cloaks, were animal collars and tags dozens of them. Big John had seen enough and he turned to go but snuck in one last look and saw the woman at her stove singing again, cooking what looked and smelled for all the world like vegetable soup. Big John snuck down those stairs as quietly and carefully as he could, but as soon as he reached the path by the creek he ran all the way back to town. Five miles he ran, and when he showed up at the sheriff's house he was panting and sweating and pale. And just looked just worn out and his body was just about to give up on him. He knocked on that door. Tap, tap, tap. The sheriff answered. The woman, he said. The, the cats, the dogs. He told the sheriff what he'd seen. And of course, the sheriff didn't believe him about that trap door. And he didn't believe him about the vegetable soup. But he believed him about the animal collars. Everyone in town knew that that woman stole pets and livestock and anything with fur or feathers that was small enough to fit into her sack. Everyone knew it, but no one had admitted it, because if they'd admitted it, they would have had to do something. But here was Big John standing at the doorstep of authority, and that authority decided to finally admit to himself what he already knew. It wasn't yet late, just past dinner, and the sheriff rounded up his posse and went out into the forest with guns and lanterns, ready to find the woman and bring her to justice. Big John, though, he stayed home. He'd used up all his nerve for that night, maybe for the rest of time. Now, this is where you expect the story to go all wrong, and it will, but it doesn't go wrong the way it might have. The sheriff climbed the 37 steps, his posse following. He showed up at the woman's door, banging with the handle of his revolver on the wood. Bang, bang, bang. The woman answered, and the sheriff arrested her, and the posse tore apart the cabin looking for contraband. They found the dog collars and the cat collars, and that was enough, but they found nothing else besides hot barley soup on the stove, flavored strong with garlic and wild onion. No bones, no midden, no trap door, no basement at all. Big John had just been seeing things. They marched the woman five miles back to the sheriff's office and they locked her into the town's one holding cell. And by then it was the middle of the night and the woman was steel-faced and unbroken. You have to feed her, the woman said. Feed who, the sheriff asked. Someone has to feed her, the woman said. Someone must go up there and feed my daughter. You don't have a daughter, the sheriff said. And that was that. And the woman was sent to the city for trial. And no one thought much about her again. Because what is a prison but a place to put those you wish to forget, those who make you uncomfortable? What is a prison but oblivion? A week later, Big John was walking home in the evening out along that road when he heard a terrible thing, a wrenching, a scream of wood and metal and a scream of animal throats and a scream of emptiness and horror. Then nothing, nothing happened. Except from then on, 
children from that town, they weren't returned with berry juice on their lips when they went missing. When children went missing, they stayed missing. And now there's that concrete foundation peppered with stones with a crack in it and nothing on the other side. And people don't camp there much and people don't build towns there no more. And the forest is old and no one knows how those marble stops, steps got there. And no one knows much of anything anymore. There's no moral to this to be sure. I'm not saying that you've got to let the little evils go unaddressed so you don't let out the big evil. I'm not even saying what was in that basement was evil, not for sure. I'm not saying it was right what happened to that woman, and neither am I saying it's okay to steal cats and feed them to monsters. I'm just saying it happened. I'm just telling you about the 37 marble steps and that foundation and the crack that goes off to nowhere. It's so funny to read to a non-audience. <laughs> Hello, people who can't respond. Hey, everybody. It was so great to hear you read that. Um, it just, you know, brings brings it to life in a new way. Thanks. It's a great story. There's um, a lot of really great stories in this collection. It's just, it's just mind-blowing. <laughs> uh, so I think that the, the next plan is that you and I, like, chat for, like, 10 minutes. We have some questions for each other. And then yeah. kind of move it to to questions from the audience. And and some someone has already asked a question from the audience, and we'll get to that after we do a little bit more of this. And other people, please feel free to put your questions in the little question chat down in the I don't know what direction it is for y'all. So should I should I ask first? Yeah, you want to? Yeah. Um. So your stories often feature radicals, revolutionaries. I wrote it down and people on the edges of mainstream society trying to carve out a space in terrifying presence, futures, and parallel realities. Was this something that always showed up in your work um, or did you have to be deliberate about it? I think it's, it's always been there, at least since my life kind of took those turns. You know, um, I think that I, I was just naturally drawn to write characters that uh, reminded me of me and my friends and reminded me of people you know, I mean, actually, at first, it's like if you see a punk protagonist who's like a punk traveling anarchist, that's like the that's like easy mode for me as an author, <laughs> you know, because um, I'm like, oh, I'm writing about me or my or like the people I've traveled with for a long time or something. And right. and I I liked doing it and I still do it, but it's I try to also not just do that, but I, I like doing it because um, I don't see us represented very much in fiction. You know, um, there's a decent amount of really good memoir coming out of you know, traveler uh, communities and, and punks and stuff like that, and radicals and revolutionaries. And actually there are radicals and revolutionaries in fiction, but but they're they're usually represented really one-dimensionally. And I actually kind of want to ask you about how you feel about this too when, when mm -hmm. done, because I feel like if you throw in the revolutionary character, they're the like one-dimensional firebrand, even if the author is sympathetic, you know, very often they're the, the noble who, the the, they believe so strongly in the cause that it's okay that they die and the thing can move on without them. Or, you know, I, I feel like very rarely are these people real people. And uh, mm. I think that's a shame because these are real people and they have real um, feelings. And it, I, I think it, I think it distances ourselves when we're like, oh, the revolutionaries are these pure radicals, but we're not like that. It kind of allows us to sort of wait around for the pure radicals to come and save us. Whereas right. like, we're in a fucking mess right now. I and mean, we've been in a mess for a long time, especially people at different intersections of marginalization. But, um, you know, we, we kind of need to pull some shit out of the last minute right now, you know? And, and so I really, so that is the intentional part, right? Maybe is that at some point I started consciously realizing that I want to normalize these sorts of characters. Not necessarily, I'm not saying like people should go be punks or like go hitchhike or whatever, but, but people who position themselves against the norms of society um, absolutely, we need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel it's like great to see. Yeah, it's great to see how how you do that. They, you know, they're complicated. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're not right. They argue with each other. They're afraid. Sometimes they don't do the noble thing. Um, um, sometimes they do, and it's not romanticized. It's it's treated as you know the messy thing it is. Um, and 
it's just it's amazing to see that kind of complexity. I think you're right. I think that a lot of these stories, and it's frustrating when you see it. That it's um, they're one dimensional. They're they're very, or they seem you know, you know, supernaturally committed in a way that um, I think doesn't yeah. you know lend well to kind of um seeing them as as full human beings. And as you said, people that you know. It's people that we don't have to wait to save us. It's 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 the people that we know. I think yeah. That, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So my question for you that I wrote down notes of, and then um, it, for some reason I keep thinking of monsters when I think of your book. Not that it's in the title or anything. Um, <laughs> and and one of the reasons that's so interesting to me is this concept of monstrosity is is super fascinating to me and it's kind of a two-part question and one is like the kind of broader question of um what does monstrosity mean to you when you're writing these characters who are protagonized or whatever who are perceived as monstrous by society and then my my second question is i'm curious whether the the concept of the sort of the like super predator uh because okay so you you know in the the excerpt that you read from um a, a black man is killed by police while he is a a predator while he is a monster and the cop doesn't even realize he's killing a, a human right um and and then the cop almost like freaks out when he uh, when he's like oh i killed a human i didn't even know i was doing that i don't know whether the cop would have done it anyway you know who knows um well uh, statistics no but no. um <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i i wonder whether um this this concept of um you know representing someone as like this like predator to the the police's point of view was was conscious or whether I'm completely off base or or how you feel about monsters and that. Those are my questions that I somehow tied into one. Right. So um so I'll say that like, you know, sometimes I'll get people talking about the book and they'll say like the monsters are an allegory for other kinds of marginalizations. And I and I I sort of see it as a intersectional kind of marginalization. And it manifests, okay. uh -huh. you know, differently depending on um the the person's background, the monster's background, and some monsters have privilege, and you can you can tell by how they behave, you know, like um, and then some monsters um don't, and they and they're and they're marginalized uh, on top, they're marginalized as monsters and as people, and you can see that um how that acts in their in their lives and how that leads to them being, um, feeling like ruthless, um, like without root, um, without rooting or footing within the world. And now that leads to, you know, you know, tragedy happening. I think that Lincoln is one of those characters. And to answer the other question, I, I feel like, you know, it was one of those very early images when I thought, okay, well, on, on one level, if it was going to come out, how would it come out, right? And I thought it would be a marginalized monster it would be, uh, and it would be the kind of person, you know, that I would recognize and, um, and I thought, well, you know, this makes sense. It just made sense to me. And I think that the the other part of it is it's definitely playing with the idea of how Black people, Black men are perceived within the world um, when they're not turning into monsters, right? You know, they're described in these kinds of ways, like hulking and stuff. Like that stuff is very deliberate. And um, the um, And it also, for me, it was like, one of the things that I thought was really frustrating about like discourse or is frustrating about discourse around police brutality is how quickly it gets reduced to what's in the frame. And it's, you know, it's talking about like, well, this person did this and then that that made the, the cop freak out and all that stuff. When it's really, you know, deeply rooted systems and it's um, histories of um, um, oppression and prejudice and hatred. And um, I felt like showing that showing a monster turning back into human opens up the frame and so the rest of the story is kind of like exploring all of the the um the tentacles of the webs that reach out from that moment and i thought that well you know this is kind of the way that i wish we talked about it in the real world and so on that level on a thematic level i thought it was important to have you know that first moment be a black man um, you know, who was, you know, once homeless, who was struggling with addiction, be the one that, um, you know, you know, suffered in this way and opened up the world to this revelation. Yeah, no, I, 
I think you did a really good job of the including class and in, in monstrosity, you know, like um, I hadn't even thought of that until you were just saying it. And I'm thinking about not to spoil anything for the book, but you have all these societies and stuff like that and the way they interact with class and and you're actually able to paint um even from like like some of the more monstrous groups are the upper class groups, mm -hmm. like monstrous from my ethical stance, right? You have these groups that are like the upper class, I don't know. It's it's really good. People should read this book if they haven't already. Um Thank uh, you. <laughs> um, I wanted to, okay, so I wanted to ask because I noticed in a lot of your stories, um, a significant number of your stories, you you write in first person. You know, there's uh -huh. some third person stories in there as well, and you do a great job with that too. But I just wondered, uh, because it's, it's very hard to make, you know, all these first persons so distinct, and they are. And so mm -hmm. I just wonder how how do you find your way into those voices? How do you bring those those characters to life from their own voice? Oh, that's interesting. In my mind, writing first person is like easy mode because you, you're you acting. You're like, okay, I'm this person. Ah. What do I do? You know, because I feel like, it, okay, the way I write dialogue is I have two different or many characters in my head and I I, I wind them up and I, I let them go at each other and talk and sometimes fight or something, right? And... And it makes writing dialogue sometimes very fast for me once you get them wound up correctly. Sometimes you have to go back and be like, whoops, wrong, wrong robot. Got to go find another wind up toy. Um, but the reason I like writing first person, uh, which I do kind of subconsciously, is that it, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's almost like writing dialogue. I'm like, okay, who is this person? What are their interests? What are they doing? What do they care about? Um, but yeah, no, but okay, but it actually ties into what I want to ask you, because one of the first conversations, um, uh, I think the only time we've met in person, um, we've talked a lot as, you know, peers in this writing world or whatever, but um, I met Cadwell at a, at a party and we talked about um, code switching and we talked about code switching in fiction and how people who don't have to code switch in the same ways. And I don't have to code switch in the same ways as like, you know, a, a black man does, right? I have to code switch in this way where, you know, wh whether because of class or gender or whatever, I'm, or subcultural affiliation, I might have to code switch in different situations. And when people who don't code switch in similar ways or don't do as much code switching, read my fiction, I've had editors and stuff come back and be like, oh, no one talks like this. Like, oh, this isn't, this isn't realistic. Um, you know, I, there's a story in here where the hitchhiking character uses like both big words and like cuss words in the same sentence or whatever. Right. And, you know, and I had an editor, an editorial feedback. Um, I won't say who, it wasn't by the people who published it in the end. Uh, you know, being like, oh, that's not realistic. And I'm like, I, I don't understand a world in which that's unrealistic and I don't know it. And so I'm kind of curious how, like, how you handle writing. Well, I kind of just almost wanted to like reinitiate that conversation and see if I can figure out what, because you said such cool shit about it then, but I want to see if I can trick you into saying cool shit about it now, because <laughs> in fiction. Well, no, it's 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 interesting, and I and I get excited you bringing it up because um and at that point at that point in time I I think I was pretty raw because um I was submitting stuff in in workshop I was in the, the MFA at the time I believe mm -hmm. and um. Um, I would sometimes get pushback on this, like, um, you know, I'll have someone using vernacular in particular, you know, I would have characters, sometimes they'll be using AAVE, but sometimes they'll be using St. Tommy in English, you know, it's the variety from back home, but they would use it, and it has, a, you know, its own grammar rules and patterns and all this stuff, and then sometimes it would use big words, and, yeah. you know, and I would, you know, I think about this, and this feels completely natural to me, because when I go home, and I hang out with my friends or I hang out with family. Um, particularly if I hang out with my with my friend, I'm thinking about um, Elliot. We'll use vernacular and we'll use big words when we need to, and we'll you know we'll pull from all of these different um, these different registers. And it was like that in school, and it's and it's like that you know just talking to people and hanging out at a bar. It's it's that kind of fluid um, or that fluency is normal but i think that in popular culture or in 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 the in the dominant culture there's this um idea that you can't you can't have vernacular and speak 
with, you know, and access words from a higher register at the same time. And I think it's this kind of like people that don't understand close which are just people don't understand that like a vernacular is a cultural touchstone. It's not just a, a, a signal and it's not even a signal of intelligence. You know what I mean? And so it's, it's, it's deeply frustrating when I, and it was deeply frustrating when I would get those pushbacks in workshops. And I just, I just kind of just leaned in. I started studying linguistics and, um, you know, I was like, prove me wrong. You know what I mean? Like, and so, um, and I would do tricks, you know, some of those things I would try to lead people to, to the understanding on their own. I'd have a character show up using a standard variety. Um, and then I would have them access um, uh, vernacular in a particular context. So I'd do it the other way around and, um, and kind of, you know, or at least I'm trying to teach the reader to expect this kind of thing that you, that these people are not fixed because um, people aren't fixed in, in this way that people tend to imagine. Um, yeah. Well, I think you do. I'm sorry that happened. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry no. that happened to you with the editor because. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it happened to you too. You know, it's just it's this thing where people don't expect. Yeah, you're right. In like mainstream fiction, it's like pick one, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. um, when I imagine like most of the way that like black men are portrayed in media, they are either talking to AAVE or they are like very good. And, and I'm using the word articulate intentionally as kind of a, you know, like they're like, yeah, it's like it, it, everyone has to like pick one or something like that. And it, it's really, it doesn't seem true. And I think that that's one thing that I think seems to be one of the strengths of your writing. And I feel like maybe it's like for people who are used to, um, navigating all that and thinking about that shit it seems like very useful in terms of writing fiction to be able to well to to recognize that characters are complex and can think in these different ways and like instead of creating these fucking one-dimensional characters you know um mm -hmm. yeah i don't know same i i love that in your fiction too and nice. you know you bring up a good point because i'm thinking about tv shows and examples i really like and you're it's hard pressed to find you like someone that's moving around like that it happens okay. you know i think that you know a good example of it you know um it happens quite a bit in the wire um and i i was thinking about atlanta um but you don't see it a lot you don't see that kind of like you know um the movement across it, you you have a character that speaks a certain way and then you have another character that speaks like you know like in a more standard variety and there tends to be some kind of um you know, the person speaking a vernacular, making fun of the person that's, you know, using a more standard mm -hmm. um, vernacular. Um, but in reality, people access all kinds of things across that spectrum. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have um, another question because I, you know, this this collection is very much a horror collection. And I was just wondering, like, um, but it's also very, like, um, radical. And, that, and I was... I was thinking, you know, why is horror and dark fantasy such a useful vehicle for exploring like radical thought or revolutionary thought in your in your opinion? You know, um, it's funny because like uh, I keep saying that I never set out to write horror and that it, it's becoming less and less true as I kind of lean in a little bit to writing horror. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, uh, I'll, OK, it's an exaggeration. I don't know if I'll hold by it, but all politics is about power all like revolutionary change, all of these things are just about changing the way we navigate with and hold power and share power and, and things like that. And one of, and I think that horror is about power. And more than that, I think like magic is about power. And so anytime I think about, you know, writing the real world, but with magic, it's not like, oh, and then the elevator moves up and down by magic. It's like, oh, and then we, summon a demon to protect our town or you're not even a demon you're like oh we found a spirit that will protect us the word for spirit that will protect us is demon right because like you know this thing that can like run around and fuck shit up is um how will that actually carry itself out in the world and if someone actually has that kind of power what does it do to them what are the things that they manifest or what are they able to do and it it looks like horror and you know because also if people get killed by creatures that don't exist it's going to be horrific even if it's like a righteous killing you know even if it's like ah that guy had it coming i totally didn't write a book in which a deer eviscerates cops at the end of it um <laughs> you know and like but it's like it's still 
on some level, this like unsettling and this, this horror element. Um, and so I feel like I tried to set out writing um, not urban fantasy, but modern fantasy. And I, I wound up with horror. And then eventually I did kind of lean into it more, um, you know, and and I think I go at it with a different goal than a lot of horror. But I also think, OK, but in terms of how it's a useful vehicle, I feel like there's an unsettling. The thing that I love about horror isn't fear necessarily, and it certainly isn't gore. I kind of don't care one way. Actually, I kind of negatively care about gore personally, but that's because I'm squeamish. Um, but instead, like on the unsettling feeling where you you are, it, it kind of lifts you out of your current sense of reality. And I think I like it because when you lift yourself out of the current sense of reality, you don't know where you can land. And you suddenly have this like, well, we could land anywhere. We are not moored to the current expectations. Um, I don't know. That, that's that's the kind of stuff I've been thinking about more and more. I like. You know, again, I, I, I was like, I, I grew up reading mostly science fiction and fantasy, but then I, I find myself writing more and more uh, horror. I don't know. Um, but then like, okay, but that's sort of interesting to compare to, to your book because I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think your book is classified as horror. Um, speaking of words that I pronounce differently than other people and I kind of don't care. <laughs> um, and people give me shit about sometimes I'm like whatever I write in this genre, I can call it whatever fuck I want. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I feel like you play with a lot of the same themes. Um, and actually, what's funny is we're sort of, okay, I'll segue this into a question from the audience we got asked because you, mm -hmm. you managed to ask a, there's a question from the audience. Uh, Do you have anything to say on the intersection between anarchism and horror? And I feel like that's basically kind of what you asked, at least about social change and stuff. Um, so I'm curious your take around it and how you feel about your work as relates to to things like horror and and why, I mean, uh, you know, you also have monsters and you have a lot of the things that are in horror. I actually don't know what you how it gets classified your book. I would, you know, I often say it has horror elements or some moments that slip into horror. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I would say that about the lesson too. It's kind of by accident for me. And again, like you, I've leaned in a little bit more over time. But that's because I think that like I, I gravitate to stories where there is something ineffable, ineffable or something um, mysterious under what's happening and that that is the source of horror. Like this like this this like chasm that might just open up and swallow you. And um, I, I, I view power that way. I think like, you know, I think like if you're navigating the world from a, a perspective where you're not you don't have the keys things that are happening in the world tend to seem, or at least they they felt to me for a really long time as coming from some unknown source. It's like some, some, um, some great darkness or some deep, you know, mysterious place. And um, that feeling is horror, that feeling of like being in a world and not understanding the world you, you, you're in or feeling like you know, recognizing yourself and your full humanity, but then entering spaces where you that's not recognized, and there's there's reasons that you can't point to because that's not your experience as um, for why that's not recognized. Um, and so I think it, for me, it gets it's like really like a natural process for me to like slip into horror because I feel like I I feel like the world regularly on a daily basis just slips into horror and then just moves back and then you're looking at like um like um kittens again or something you know like it's <laughs> the world just feels that way it's like oh this crazy thing happened and then oh yeah now we're now we're making jokes again um and just existing on a whole just feels very strange to me the fact that it's so unquestioned that we're alive and we exist and we're in this space with all these other people and everyone's confused and pretending not to be and we're just like you're just like I don't know like um like marbles or um pool balls just smacking against each other it just feels like very chaotic and strange to me and that's also like the way horror draws up from and I think that like um that the relationship between anarchism and horror I feel like you know I see um the the way that I see anarchism or at least th th this kind of thinking of self of self governance um of governance within a community that is of empowered people is that they're kind of like taking all of those um you know all of those like safety apparatuses off and 
trying to navigate the world or trying to glimpse the world as it is and that's terrifying you know like you 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 have to start holding on to each other and you have to start holding on to yourself when you kind of like remove the the walls and the and the siding and all of these things that you kind of use for support um and you know the characters in the book are kind of like trying to navigate this new world not knowing any of the rules and trying to lean on themselves and each other in order to do it and so um i don't know if that answers the question but it's 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 something that i think about like how do you how do you live in a world where the rules either don't make sense or you hate them you know how do you invent some of your own and then how do you how do you maintain those things um within the world when the world is actively trying to dismantle them yeah i i really like that answer i'm going to mostly say that that's my answer too i like this idea that in some ways anarchism is acknowledging the chaos that lies underneath us all and 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 not hiding from it but instead trying to as bravely as we can acknowledge it and work with it um and you know recognizing it's going to get messy um and that's like scary that. yeah yeah um okay i'm going to read out another one of the questions to us i haven't it's longer so i don't know the i don't know the question yet until i finish reading it um roxy asks writing is often a vulnerable experience that in that it can feel like showcasing glimpses of your most inner truths, hopes, or thoughts in a way that perhaps might not be shared as easily with those that surround us in our day-to-day -day lives. My question is, as authors, have you experienced a transitory period between writing anonymously and owning your content slash allowing yourself to be tied to it? Do you now or have you ever struggled with questions of whether or not you're self-censoring your content, knowing you take full ownership or accountability, or, or accountability may be the better word for it? Um, you want to go first? Or should I try and go first? Uh, you first. It's <laughs> okay. a big question. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. Okay, so actually, it is one of the reasons that I don't write anonymously. I once a week, I think to myself, if I did all of this over, I would do it anonymously, <laughs> so that my life could be less interfered with um, by the effort of being like um, a, a public facing author right and podcaster and shit um but i i don't and I, I i'm actually still glad i made the decision i made it was actually a fairly conscious decision um i used to write under a million different names and that was my shtick even margaret killjoy wasn't the name i lived under it was just one of the many names i wrote under until i slowly was like nah, that's my name um and and i did that because i wanted to like be more anarchy about it and like whoa like no one knows who it is and i'm not trying to like build clout right my whole fear was i didn't want to build clout um but I, I realized a big reason why i moved away from that is actually this idea of accountability like um there's shit i've written as margaret kiljoy that i'm like oh if i was 25 again i wouldn't have i wouldn't write that now but i wrote it when i was 25 and i think i'm okay with that because the life progresses and hopefully people recognize that you know, in my late 30s, I'm not the same person I was when I was in my mid 20s or whatever, right? Um, I do think I'm personally glad I got out more of my raw, what do I want to say kind of stuff. Frankly, okay, I'm glad I came up before Live Journal. I'm glad I hit adulthood before the age of uh, Live Journal and then social media and whatever, because I absolutely would have written a ton of shit that it would be incredibly embarrassing to me now. Um, but I shouldn't be embarrassed about that. I should, you know, we should all actually learn to recognize that each of us are complex people. Um, but there is, I mean, frankly, there's stuff that I don't say um, because I'm not anonymous. You know, uh, for example, um, I don't talk about, I love my family, right? And I just don't talk about them in my public stuff besides like that, um, because it's no one's business and my life is too public for me to talk about my love life or my family um, in a public way and everyone's going to make different decisions about that but that's the one i've made um i don't know and uh, it's scary and the internet is mean and people will say negative shit to you um but it's better than not saying the shit that you want to say and um i hate the culture of trying to have to grow a thick skin in order to write i think that that's a a patriarchal concept that we bring into um i think every time we 
actively look for people to tear down, especially people who should be our comrades or whatever, um, I think we're perpetuating a sort of patriarchal idea that basically says like, in order to publish, you gotta be fucking crazy thick skinned, right? Because you can't say anything wrong ever, you know, and it's done often in the name of feminism, um, but I think it has the inverse uh, effect often. Um, I mean, other times people deserve to get consequences for the shit they say. I'm not trying to say no one should do that. <laughs> this is me trying to carefully disclaim the thing that I'm saying because I live in a fucking internet world where I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm not going to misinterpret me on purpose. Um, I feel you. I don't know. Know. Yeah, so that's my answer. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like you and I agree with that sentiment. I think that, um, you know, trying to approach things as humans first, you know, and, you know, you know, we're not talking about people that just aren't worth any time, you know, but we are talking about people that exist in, you know, that are trying to be good and trying to do good and, um, you know, sometimes trip up. Um, but, and I feel exactly the same way about like um, embarrassing things I might have said like 10 years ago, just coming back to haunt me. But, um, and there's things that I read, like I, I read things from the lesson, I read things from No Gaza Monsters. I was like, I would write that differently now you know, even like months later, you know, like I'm going back and I'm like, oh crap, now this is in print and I, I can't fix this thing. Um, but I'm, but the kind of the flip side to that is this kind of feeling like when I started, when I first started writing and publishing and I was publishing short fiction, it, it didn't feel like I was anonymous, but it did feel like I, that I would, me and my writing self were closer together. At least that was my experience. And then when I started writing books, there was this kind of effect where I started noticing that there was another Cadwell Turnbull that now existed that I had to like, like tend or trim, like, like a, like, um, you know, like a lawn or something, you know, like it was, it was, um, and it was strange and bewildering and kind of, um, you know, um, alienating, like, you know, and it's been this like kind of journey towards trying to bring that self closer back to myself again and trying to kind of reclaim my own name as it appears because so much of this is like tied up like we're writing books and we you know we write books or um we try to write books with like radical ideas in them but we exist within this capitalist capitalist you know um capitalistic system where you have to like sell that stuff and that it, it's so easy to start feeling like a product and start embracing yourself as a product and so like that has been the thing that has been the worst for me like it's you know I mean it's part of accountability trying to not like um over gloss myself but then also it's it's like this feeling of being like replaced with like this other person that isn't me but this image or this product to me and um I think that you know it's one of the reasons why I try to I I, I tend to the things that make me nervous is more like things that have to do with I, I do bring some of my my own life and some of my own traumas into my fiction and so I try to be careful with that stuff um, but I try not to not to shy away from my actual ideas the things that I actually think um, to try to counteract that kind of like packaged self that I feel gets created as soon as you start publishing on a certain level is the is yeah. the, the way that I um, experienced it. Yeah, there's like the whole trying to explain to people that I'm like, well, um, the publishers will look at my Twitter uh, engagement. Um, they will look at how many followers I have when they make the decision about whether or not to publish my book. And I hate that. I I don't like living in that world. I get jealous of oh, my friends get to interact with social media as like people where they're like, yeah, I'm sad today. And I'm like, man, I don't say I'm sad today on fucking social media because I'm never sad. All I do is write amazing fiction that you can get. At right. Oh, books. gosh. You know, like, but it's like, but if I do say I'm sad, then a bunch of people I don't know say that they're sorry. And I'm like, never mind. I didn't want to do this. You know, I just wanted to talk to my. It's it, feels, weird... it feels more, you're trying to be real, but it feels super vulnerable. And it feels like you're, yeah. You're, you you just want to express a feeling and be and live in it, but it feels like you're asking for something, or at least yeah. it presents that way because so many, so much of the time on social media, that's how Twitter feels to me too. It feels like even if I wanted to like be a real person in between my book 
look yeah. what happened. You know, it it feels it feels like those things are happening too often and it overshadows any any realness. And it also feels like that realness becomes cultivate like being next to that promotional self kind of like consumes that you know those um attempts yeah. at trying to be authentic it's like it eats it eats it up yeah. um and it, it the first time I noticed I was like this is I noticed myself shrinking away from wanting to be on social media as myself and I wanted to just be myself in the real world you know because I felt like that that space is no longer mine that's for Catwell Turnbull the person on that cover you know like yeah um which is sad it's sad um and I find that deeply frustrating that you know they look at you know follower accounts and stuff because I'm like yeah because then you just have to not only are you now a writer you have to also you know perform you have to you have to be a personality and I just absolutely I absolutely cannot that's just <laughs> that's not <Yeah>. gonna happen <laughs> yeah um there's another question um uh, orion asks what are your thoughts about on the legacy of reactionary and fascistic within horror especially in regards to writers such as lovecraft or poe you, you go had first? a great story within your collection yeah. about this that was like <laughs> so cool oh yeah no i remember <laughs> that yeah um oh man i i mean like i i definitely feel like i've been influenced by Lovecraft but I was I don't know I I think that I came to I started out um with speculative fiction through science fiction and then I found my way to fantasy and then I found my way to horror so that was like my entry like I used to watch Star Trek with my mom and then I um I was a huge fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer back in mm -hmm. back in the day and um and and then I found myself to fiction and then I found myself, you know, going down that road to horror. But it wasn't because I was so accidental. I didn't really, um, I really don't feel like I, I come from that, you know, place or that I don't necessarily consider that, you know, um, a direct influence, but I am influenced by people and narratives that are influenced by that. And there's ways that you can just see that kind of just even the way that we think about um monsters is the thing that I was pushing back against in the fiction is so deeply rooted in this kind of like you know you know fascist but also very you know racist ideas about like you know who who can be fully human you know and that that there's so many times that you you investigate or you poke at a monster from from our um from the literary canon and then you see that it's really a, a, like some racial racial analog. Um, and that stuff is scary. And so like um, writing about monsters within this context, I, I wanted to have like, I wanted to divorce that from being codified as just marginalization. I wanted it to be like, this is, you can be one thing and a monster. And um, I think that that was my rebellion, but it wasn't a direct rebellion to to Lovecraft. I know, and I've read things that were in response to Lovecraft. Um, and then I've also seen quotes um, from Lovecraft fiction that are deeply disturbing, and that is just kind of like made me stay away from it. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that within the culture, it's just there, and if you want to if you want to take these things in a different direction, you have to like reckon with these kinds of ideologies that have just been kind of like become part of the way we think about, you know, these things. You know, I've definitely been drawn to more recent horror, which um, has the the monster as protagonist or has, has um, an empowerment arc for the monster or some kind of, um, you know, like the example is a Babadook where the, the, there's a relationship formed between the human and the monster and it's there's this this kind of looking at monstrosity as trauma and that kind of stuff and I think that like you know modern horror is doing a lot more with that and it's exciting yeah for for me um uh yeah actually the the most directly I've confronted Lovecraft is I I wrote a story in this that um is absolutely influenced directly it's about Lovecraft it's a story in which 
uh, the, I claim, a character claims that Lovecraft stole all of his ideas um, from something that happened to an actual black man in the 19th century um, and basically like plagiarized all of his ideas and from something that, from like a real horrific thing that happened. Um, and, you know, and it's about a character who's losing her mind and trying to explore all of those things. But I, you know, I also, coming more from science fiction and fantasy, I only started engaging with Lovecraft and, and the horror tropes more a little bit later. Um, and so I came into it starting being like, wait, that's just that weird racist, right? Um, and so like, why would I have anything to do with it? And then slowly, it's interesting to see like, okay, well, what are his ideas? And, and the thing that's really interesting to me about, I think it's Elder Chars, the word for Lovecraftian stuff or, or the thing that he's also touching upon. Um, you know, I had a friend of mine who uh, is usually right about stuff. And she was like, oh, all Lovecraftian horror, like all eldritch horror comes from this uh, racist fear of the other. And I said, but have you seen the creatures that live under the ocean? Um, and she's a tall ship sailor. So she's like, yes, I love those creatures. And I'm like, no, they're horrific. They scare me. They have tentacles and they or they crawl and I don't like it, you know? Um, and like, and so I feel like there's this concept of like, being so confused that it's scary, like something that's so alien and other that it's scary. And to me, the idea of like applying that to people is like so fucked up that I like, that's the part where I'm like, I don't get that kind of horror, right? In terms of like, because, and which is part of why Lovecraft was so fucking racist is because it wasn't just like, I'm afraid of black men because they do this and that violence that I've been told they do or whatever, you know, like, but instead, it's this like, their skin is the wrong color. It, it, like, it's like just really fucking racist. Um, although I did have someone tell me recently, and I haven't looked into this. I, I heard someone tell me recently that he like recanted near the end of his life. And he was like, oh, God. Um, and he was like, I, I, I think it was one like, I could be really, really wrong about this. I'm literally just saying something someone told me. That like when the Nazis came around, he was like, oh, I see where what I was talking about leads to. And um, that's embarrassing and bad. Uh, and I don't know. And I'm not trying. I'm, I'm actually not trying to give Lovecraft a redemption arc. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to learn about that, though. It's, I know. It's I want to. I learned about like three or four days ago and I haven't had time to look it up. Um, but so but in terms of the reactionary and the fascistic within any culture or aesthetic I try to get into my whole thing is like not letting Nazis have nice things and not letting have people have nice things and and I think that horror is far too nice of a thing to like let people have in the same way that like I, I play black metal and you know um, a lot of the people in the second wave of black metal were like wildly fucking racist and, and fascistic and I'm kind of like well that doesn't mean everyone who plays black metal is a Nazi because if you say that then you take all these apolitical people and you hand them to the Nazis on a plate mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that um, and so I feel the kind of same way about horrors. I'm kind of like, whatever, it's ours now, fuck you. And I think that actually some of the new horror that you're talking about um, is doing that. It's like being like, whatever, ours now, fuck you. We actually know more about what it means to be horror, especially monstrous protagonists. The, the Lieber Monstorum, I reference this in this book, the Lieber Monstorum, the first like English book of monsters or whatever, has a trans woman on the first page, but also has black people from Africa. And it's like alongside chimeras and mermaids and shit these like horrific Whoa. things that might exist in the world um yeah no it's dark and uh and so it's like well we've been called monsters for fucking ever you know so like there's like something that you kind of can't have it fuck you it's ours mm -hmm. no absolutely uh, you also yeah. you did like um there's a there's another story and i'm like i'm i'm spacing on the title in the in a collection where it's like um um you know, warriors from Valhalla come back to yeah. fight in different, you know, battles, you know, and they're, they're against the fascists and they're talking about, you know, you have a moment where they're, you, you know, trying to differentiate. Well, we weren't great, <laughs> but we weren't that, you know, and I thought that was, you know, that kind of thing of like not letting them have nice things, you know, like taking those things that they, um, that they co-opt and, and turning it on his head and presenting you know, this other, you know, feminine aspect to Odin and doing all this stuff, this kind of work is just, it's really cool and invaluable, you know, so not just in horror. Thanks. <laughs> um, there's another question in the chat. Uh, M Snowball says, 
How do you all feel about fan culture? Have there been people who follow your work, listen to your podcast and make you feel uncomfortable with the way they express their feelings about your work, the way it makes them feel, the sense of parasocial connection? Which I guess gets kind of the stuff you were talking about earlier about how you present yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I was I was thinking about that independent to how other people respond is just the feeling I get presenting that self. But it's, and I, and I don't think, you know, I have interactions with people that just generally warm my heart and make me feel like, well, this is why I do this. You know, it tends to be like one-on-one -on -one interactions where I'm like, well, this is the important thing, not the review that I got from X, you know, you know, uh, publication. Um, and, but then there's, there's also this kind of, and I see it with a lot of, you know, and I think this is our fault. I think that part of it is just, is capitalism. The fact that we, we, we um we disproportionately reward um certain and this you know it's kind of complicated within art it's not that everyone's getting these rewards it's like five people and then they're just like you know just become these mega stars but then that that kind of impression that you get of like the 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 mega star author affects how people think about other authors and they think like um you trying to carve out um, space for your own emotional health or your own like um, physical health? Are you trying to, you know, talk about you know, um, you know, um, equity and labor and that kind of stuff? Is you being privileged even when you're a working author and you 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 can barely like you know rub two nickels together, right? Like this, the image of like uh, you know, I try not to call out anybody in particular, but the image of this like this author that has some house in the in rural Maine or, or somewhere um <laughs> that's just just hanging out you know with uh -huh. their many dogs and then you the, it's it's extrapolated to everyone and when when authors talk about you know um you know how how difficult and how soul-sucking this this profession can be there tends to be a not not a lot of empathy and then they also tend to be a not not a lot of like understanding the human side of the creation of art. So like you create art and then you, people come to it and they there's not, or there's, there's sometimes it's this absence of generosity that there's, there's a human behind this thing, you know, doing their best. Um, and that can be frustrating at times, you know, it's it's not, it's not always the case. And I do think generally people tend to be very warm and tend to, you know, um, look for the humanity in the, in the, in the people um, who do the work that they admire. But sometimes you get interactions where you just feel like an alien and it's, you know, it's doubly awkward or uncomfortable when you're already marginalized and you feel like an alien anyway. You know, you then feel like this kind of like objectified alien like it's um like doubly objectified in this strange way and um you know that sounds very negative towards fandom that's not what I mean because <laughs> I think that most of it is not like this but occasionally I feel like there's this this conflation of person with product on that side and um it can be it can be um you know alienating Tell me one of those examples of a personal moment that was like, oh, this is why I do this. Oh, well, you know, there was someone that reached out to me um, on Twitter, actually, you know, sometimes these things happen, you know, <laughs> where it's a good place. And, um, you know, um, you know, she DM'd me and she talked about losing her, her brother to addiction. And, you know, I was writing from a place um, of loss too. And it was, and she was talking about how, you know, and she was a, you know, writer and she said that it was helping her through some things and, you know, giving her the courage to write about her experience. And that just made me um, just feel, you know, it's a difficult thing. It's not, it's not a nice thing. It's a hard thing, but it made me feel good that, that doing that kind of work could be encouraging, um, not necessarily healing, but encouraging someone to do their own healing work. Um, that's just wonderful. And so moments like that, I just love, um, and someone just, you know, saying like this, this story resonated with me in some special way. Um, and it happens a lot, you know, it, it definitely, um, 
I think that the the problem often is that it, it's it is a it is I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't like <laughs> it is hard to manage all of those you know you relationships like suddenly you just there's, there's, there's people that know you that you don't know right and then you you have to meet them you know and and that that can be that can be challenging because sometimes you don't measure up to what they think you should be um you know um and you know sometimes it's you know you, it's you're having you know a day because things are going on in your life that you can't present like a consistently x anything um but you know navigating that despite the difficulties i think there's there's moments of reward and those moments are are important and valuable too so i i feel like i'm rambling i don't know if i have like a it's it's both i i i think it's really great and then it's, it's sometimes it's hard yeah i'm an introvert too so i feel like that's another <laughs> part of it yeah yeah i'm a um I think I'm an outgoing introvert that I can like turn on and be like, now I will present and be the center of attention like I'm doing right now. And then as soon as this is over, I'm going to go crash, um, you know, and, and stare yeah. at the creek or whatever. Um, and yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think about a lot now that I, I feel like, okay, like, like podcasting in particular is like a parasocial relationship machine. Like that's like, I mean, even the, the capitalist engine behind podcasting is parasocial relationship creation, right? It's like people um being like oh I like this person who I don't know because podcasting is so personal you hear someone in your ear being like or like people you know have people you don't know people you think you know having a conversation and I it's like okay and it's not okay like um, I mean I obviously participate in this like um but I but I participate in both ways right like um you know I uh someone a, a youtuber i i quite look up to came to a uh, talk of mine recently and they came up to get my book signed and i'm like do i know you from youtube and it's almost like oh god damn it you know i, I actually don't want to be me right now i want to be the person who's getting my book signed or whatever I, I i don't know how this person felt in that situation but that was like my read um but parasocial relationships are real um and they're not real relationships it's a thing that happens and it happens to everyone. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And I think overall, I've found people handle that responsibly. I'm actually really glad it gets named, right? So we like have a better means by which to say, ah, this is the person that I think I know who doesn't know me. Um, you know, and we all have those things because we consume media um, and it's, it's okay. Um, in terms of fan culture in general, like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's people are creepy, but but frankly, people were creepier to me when I was like, it to be rude, when I was like a young, hot cis boy, like people were really creepy to me and I wasn't that famous yet or whatever. And I'd be at a convention and people would fucking creep on me really hard. Right. And now I'm a like approaching middle-aged trans lady and people are less, my fans are less creepy to me because I think fewer people are sexualizing me. Um, and uh not that women aren't sexualized a lot, but just, I don't know, whatever, something about my motion, trans femininity, or I don't know, whatever. Um, and I don't know, it's fucking weird, but, but fan culture is also like, I like that people appreciate what I do. Um, and I appreciate what other people do. And mostly what I want to create is a culture of um, equality where we respect the things that people do, even if it's not like everyone has to go out and be a creator, you know, it's like, uh, authors are not more important than cooks, right? And like authors are not more right. important than organizers and, you know, all of these other things that people are like, I'm a nothing. I'm like, what do you do? And like, oh, I'm a paramedic. I'm like, well, fuck you. <laughs> You're not nothing. Like, you know, um, and, but yeah, That's I do fair, have moments. Yeah. yeah. Well, my, my, my go-to moment of like, oh, this is why I do it was that um, a mom messaged me to say that when the storm hit Texas and everyone lost power a year or two ago, um, her son only had like some like flashlight and like some stuff that, you know, lived in a basement, some shitty, terrible basement and apartment or whatever, with no windows and only had stuff because she had listened to my prepper podcast and been like, that's it. I'm sending my kid a flashlight, you know? And I'm like, oh, I can have tangible effects on the world. That's cool. You know? Um, and I get those equivalents with fiction too, right. That are similar to what you're talking about. Um, so I don't know. Fan culture is fine as long as it's not 
uh, like people just uh, and and the, and the uh, the artists need to remember it too that we're not fucking better than the other people and and most of the people I find within like uh, radical and like anarchist creative cultures are aware of that. Um, and even in genre fiction cultures, most people are very aware that they're like, I am a famous author and I struggle to pay my mortgage, you know, mm-hmm, or rent mm-hmm. or fucking live in a van or whatever. Anyway. Yeah. You, 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 you said that so much better. I think <laughs> it's definitely the right way to think about it. Um, no, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I, I, and I agree. I think most people that I've run into handle it quite responsibly. You only occasionally is it, and mostly if it's if it's not good, it's just kind of awkward. It's not it's not terrible, you know. Yeah. I, you know, it's kind of rare to get like a like a terrible example. And I really can't really point to anything that's truly terrible. Um, maybe like a handful of things. So it's um, absolutely, you know, like I'm trying to you know balance those two things in my head. Yeah. Um. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Um, right. And the only, uh, to, to be rude, Orion, uh, we've already answered some of your questions, so we probably won't answer this last one. Um, but, okay, how, what, what are you working on now? You're working on all those short stories you've been writing. Are they going to be anthologized anywhere? Um, what, are you, what are you doing? What are you up to? So, um, well, I don't know. That's that's a good question. If there's going to ever be a collection, I think I need to write more stories before that happens. That's what you're asking, right? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I when I don't do know we get have there, enough? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if I have <laughs> enough stories yet. I mean, I do have like I'm trying to think. I do have like I think maybe a dozen published stories, maybe a little bit more than that. I think you. I think I want maybe maybe four or five more that I can then like pick the best ones from those. Um, but who knows? So maybe someday. Right now, I'm working on the second book in this, you know, because this is a series. Oh. Yeah. And um, it's it's just it's it's kind of you know, it's been challenging doing it while because I teach, and so it's been you know a struggle doing it while teaching. But it's been you know it's going like it's it's longer. It's now longer than anything I've ever written. There's still some work to be done. Um, but it's. And you know, I'm, I'm, then I'm also excited about writing the third one once I get through the second one. Then I have some ideas for things down the road, and and I and I do, I'm I really want to get back to writing more short stories. I feel like it's um it's the thing that has kind of fell off the mold since I started writing like books and things. And I just you know, I think a big piece of my heart is with short fiction. What about you, what are you working on? Um, well, I got really lucky in that, well, lucky, I did a lot of work that hasn't yet come out. So even though I'm mostly at the moment writing fiction, that's, uh, or sorry, nonfiction, I'm mostly writing podcast scripts, honestly, um, because a weekly podcast is a demanding thing. Um, yeah. but I have a book coming out next spring called Escape from Incel Island. That's like just a novella about, uh, what if someone had thrown all of the men who feel like they are deserve that women are owed to them by the government? What if they were all in a big open air prison? Um, and, uh, that's, that's That's a a book that I have. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a book I have coming out next February. Probably I'll be doing more announcements about it soon. I just didn't want to like, because I have two books coming out reasonably quickly. So I had to be careful about the promotion. Um, so, so that's the next project I have coming out. Um, and yeah, I think we are at time. Ash, do you have like closing remarks or? Yeah. Wow, y'all, thank you so much for this fantastic uh, discussion and readings. You know, uh, often readings don't translate quite as well in the virtual format because it can be a little awkward without that response from the audience, uh, like you noted, but I think you both did a really fantastic job at delivering your stories. Um, So thanks so much for doing that. Um, And thanks so much to folks in the audience who came and asked uh, really great questions. I think it made for a uh, fascinating discussion um, and touched on some really uh, topics with some depth to them. So thanks for that. Uh, I just dropped the links to the books if folks haven't picked them up yet. It's a great way to support these writers and to support Firestorm. And if you registered for this event, you'll get a follow-up email with a link to the recording. uh, So you can watch it again, if you so choose. Um, And Cadwell, Margaret, thank you so much again 
uh, for doing this tonight. And we'll definitely keep an eye out uh, for your next books as they get released uh, and, and would love to see you again somewhere down the line. Thank you. Thank you. Please awesome. get Margaret's book. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good night. Good Bye, night, everyone. Goodbye now.